Welcome back. It's still Wednesday, February the 26th. I'd like to thank again the volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. Um, my guest in this segment is Jennifer Chapin. Uh, she's just written a book called The Poet and the Angel. And we're going to talk about why you wrote the book and what it's about. Okay. Thank I you, look Jennifer. I forward to that. Thank you, Jack. Uh, I think the, pr the primary impetus before, uh, that led me to bringing this book out now was the murder um, and dismemberment of Shamal Khashoggi in the Saudi Embassy in Istanbul in October of 2018. I have been long committed to human rights, freedom of speech, very concerned about the war on truth, the attacks on writers that are happening as we speak. I'm very much involved with an organization called PEN America, PEN Canada, PEN International. We're very much aware of which writers are incarcerated in which countries. I think Shamal Khashoggi, uh, he was murdered because of the power of his pen. He spoke up against a very powerful regime, the Saudi Crown Prince. Even though he denied uh, involvement, he is Saudi Arabia, so nothing would have gone on without his say-so. Um, so knowing that, I brought and finished a book that I started a couple years ago about a Spanish poet who was also executed and put into an unmarked grave during the Spanish Civil War, a very well-known poet, Federico Garcia Lorca. He was mur murdered by the fascists because of the power of his pen as well. Even though he was murdered in 1936, there are many parallels to his story, between his story and what is happening now, and uh, the most obvious one, of course, was the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. I was absolutely outraged by that, so I thought, I'm bringing this out and I'm going to be much more active and vocal in the international community about uh, the war on truth and the attacks on writers, basically. If people want to look up uh, the person you, you've written about, it's, his last name is Lorca, L-O-R-C-A, and uh, Federico Garcia. So, do you want to talk a little bit about what the Spanish Civil War was about in terms of truth and fascism and related to today? Because I have a feeling we're going in the same direction. We are. I think, I think if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. And um, there was a unique moment in Spain in the 1930s where fascism started to raise its ugly head. And I think th what happened in Spain during the Civil War was the first instance of people gathering together to fight fascism. However, what happened in Spain with the rise of Franco and the, and the uh, nationalists against the Republicans, Federico Garcia Lorca represented them, Pablo Picasso, uh, many um, artists, visionaries, and painters were part of that group as well. They want a progressive change. Uh, General Franco, in alliance with the Catholic Church, did not want change. So that collusion of Catholicism and fascism was really, uh, it was, that was the impetus to bring in intellectual writers, intellectuals into Spain to fight Franco. Right. And when we say, I, I think when we say Catholicism, it means the people who happen to be heading the church at that oh, moment yes. in time, get, not uh, the people. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, let me make that absolutely clear. It was the hierarchy of Catholicism in Spain. But I must also mention to you that Franco really felt he was continuing an earlier crusade against the infidel. And this crusade actually began during the time of Arab rule in, in Andalusia, Spain. The Arabs ruled Spain from 711 to 1492, and it was Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand that started a crusade with their inquisition in tow uh, to uh, utterly uh, demolish a very progressive and golden society. Franco himself admitted that he was carrying on that crusade again. He had the buy-in of the Catholic hierarchy, and um, there, it was a terrible war. I mean, there were brothers against sisters, brothers against brothers. Spain has a dubious distinction of having the most unmarked graves, second only to Cambodia and the killing fields. They have not come to terms with that, those years of atrocity. So it was a moment in time where Hitler, Mussolini, came into Spain. They tested their weaponry. Uh, the Luftwaffe uh, uh, leveled uh, Guernica, the Picasso's, 
the castle's famous painting, Guernica. He leveled that town completely, the Luftwaffe did. So it was a moment in time where had there been intervention, perhaps, one can never rewrite history now, from some of these major countries. Well, there was intervention. There was by the intellectuals. And also by, for example, corporate America, as I mentioned earlier, well, true. was funneling money yeah. to Adolf Hitler. And the corporate oh. America yes. was funneling money to Adolf Hitler and the Nazis in the early years, even prior to the Spanish Civil War, to bring them to power. And you know, you mentioned if we don't know our history, we're doomed to repeat it. Well, who knows that? But if you Google the words Bush, Hitler, and Guardian, you will see the story in the Guardian newspaper that uh, at least is the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me because this is, this is the kind of thing that's happening now. Yes. I mean, even in the face of the murder, the terrible murder of Jamal Khashoggi, um, corporate America is still very much doing business with the Saudis. It's ab absolutely irrelevant to them who dies uh, in the meantime. Um, but in Spain at that time, Ernest Hemingway drove an ambulance or H.G. Uh, Wells was fighting in the, uh, in the trenches. You know, so W.H. Uh, Auden, I mean, it was the intellectuals, the writers, the artists, and the visionaries mm -hmm. that gathered together to fight fascism. Lorca was one of the... Who was on the other side? Besides a lot of good people, you know, at the bottom fighting the fights, but it, who was running the other side? The other side was, was Franco and the hierarchy of the Catholic yeah. Church, basically. And then uh, the Nazis came in and Mussolini right. came in to support them as so, well. So, yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the corporatists, can we call the them? The corporatists as well, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Can you give us a, we've talked, mentioned the word fascism a few times. Can, do you know a definition of fascism? Oh, I think that we're facing neo-fascism today yeah. in many parts of the, the world. The only one I've ever heard is from Mussolini. I think he said it's the mixture of corporate power and government. Yes, but, it, but also religion. I mean, I don't want to, I mean, I know, you know, the, the hierarchy of Catholicism was very much involved with fascism in Spain at that point. But you're right, it is the marriage of corporatism and government, definitely. And it absolutely will brook no opposition or no dissension. Uh, the intellectuals, thinkers, visionaries, they're anathema to regimes like that because they stand in the way of that agenda and they must be eliminated. And this is not something that happened only in the time of Hitler, it's, ab it's absolutely happening now. Uh, in many countries around the world. How about here, in terms of freedom of expression yes, and freedom of media? Exactly. Well, I mean, I think it's soft-pedaled a little bit in Canada, certainly in the U.S. There are the, well, it's obvious that journalists and the media are being targeted quite a bit in many ways. Um, I, I think that vigilance is always required. Yes, yes. And uh, that's why organizations like Penn, there's a new organization, the Amal and George Clooney Foundation uh, that came into being about a year ago. I'm uh, uh, now uh, part of that organization. They're basically organizing trial monitors and trial watchers around the world to uh, really emphasize accountability and visibility for these regimes as they bring their people to trial. And uh, so I think, yes, you're right, it's, it's a global phenomenon. We're not immune yeah. at all yeah. in this country, unless we, th we feel smug about that. Did you want to talk a little bit about the golden age in Spain uh, in, and Andalusia? You mentioned it, but you, you speak a little bit more about it here when it, it really was everybody, the, all the main religions living together in a good situation that went on for centuries. Yes, and... Um, and I we can always have that. We, you know, we don't need to be divided and fighting each other. No, we don't. It's interesting. Um, I went to Jerusalem a couple of years ago with National Geographic, and we met with a rabbi, and he said, you know, uh, you know with this Palestinian situation, I wish we could find common ground between the Jews and the Arabs. And I said, well, in history, there actually was common ground. And I started talking about this golden age of Arab rule in Al-Andalus. The Arabs invaded uh, Spain in 711. Their uh, reign ran until 1492. Granada was the last one to fall. In the 900s in Cordova, Spain, uh, they, they, Cordova, Spain was home to 900,000 people. Uh, it was uh, at the apex as far as mathematics, astronomy, medicine, arts were concerned, music at a time when Europe was just coming out of the Dark Ages. So, uh, and this was, a t this was a society that 
the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims contributed to equally. You know, the mosques sit beside the churches and the synagogues. Everybody can live happily together as long uh, as you I don't have troublemakers in the society who for their own ends want division and anger. You're always going to find them. I think now, uh, I feel very optimistic about the time that we're in. I've, I absolutely do believe we have to have vigilance. I absolutely do believe that we, we can coexist. That was a point in history where we did. And a lot of people say that that golden rule, the Arab golden rule, led uh, really contributed in a significant way towards the flowering of the Renaissance later on. You know, European nobles and uh, uh, people from Damascus and uh, Baghdad would come into Spain uh, to sit at the feet of the Great Ones and learn from them. I absolutely do believe that a coexistence is not only possible but absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. The ones who, want, who don't want that are the corporatists or the ones who have a lot to gain by having us uh, hate each other and stay at each other's throats, basically. Jennifer, thank you very much. My pleasure. I'm so thrilled that I had a chance to come in here and, Me too. and talk about the book. Thank you so much, Jack. The Poet and the Angel. Thanks very much for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.